Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by Chris Collins. We both work here at Garden Organic. We're here to give you advice and tips on organic gardening. So, what have we got for you this month? Chris joins Garden Organic's head gardener, Emma O'Neill, for a sneak preview of our new organic demonstration gardens, open to the public in July. In our listeners' post bag, we discuss whether cardboard is safe to compost, are organic slug pellets okay to use, and how to sex up a cucumber flower. And yes, Anton will reveal all for you cucumber fanatics. But first, I want to send a big thanks to all our listeners who have been posting five-star reviews. Here's a shout-out to Lindsay in Cornwall and Agatha across the waters in the US. It's a huge privilege to have such a devoted audience. And I know we wouldn't be gardening podcast of the year without the support of you lovely listeners and subscribers. Don't be shy to share a review. We love hearing from you. I'd also like to thank our brilliant sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. They're proud to offer a complete range of organic gardening products, from seeds and plants to equipment. I see, for instance, that they've got really neat netting solutions this month to keep the hungry birds off your precious crops. So shop online at organiccatalogue.com. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. So now I've got my wellies on to find Chris in the potting shed and discuss what's going on this month. Morning, Chris. How are you? Morning, Sarah. I'm good. How about you? Oh, I'm fine. A little bit damp, but I'm fine. Did you know (laughs) May was the wettest on record? How bizarre, because April must was one of the driest, wasn't it? So and the elements are really throwing at us gardeners at the moment. I think, as you've always said, a gardener is also a weatherman. And we just have to wonder what June is going to bring. But we really have got to be on the ball. And it's whether the soil is going to be too damp, damp dry too dry you know you've just got to keep your eye on the ball all the time it is a weatherman you You, you use your senses to be a gardener do you know you you feel the air you feel look at the compost you look at the soil you've got to use you look at the sky you've got to really kind of use those senses to uh to make your judgments and that makes it so exciting in some ways even if it is a bit of a pain sometimes well chris before we start talking about what we should be doing in our gardens i just wanted to share with you the most wonderful thing we have had over a quarter of a million downloads of our podcast since we that's began. A, that's absolutely brilliant. And, really, and, and you know what? Thank you for everyone who takes the time to listen to it because it, it means a lot to us, doesn't it, Sarah? It really does. Oh, huge amount. And I love the fact that whether I, I look at the analysis of it and we've got listeners all around the world. We've got Leeds, we've got Brisbane, we've got Dallas. It's just fantastic. <laughs> Dallas, I'm wondering how they're getting on with my Cockney accent, I must admit. I'm sure they're doing fine. <laughs> but what I like is the fact that we're helping to spread that whole organic message. Oh, it's brilliant. And, you know, and please do, if you've got any, got any questions or want to ask us anything, please do get in touch. You are part of the Garden Organic podcast family at the end of the day, and we love any kind of interaction. And we're very, very, uh, we're very chuffed that we're getting this listenership. It's so good. Well, moving on from that delightful statistic, let's just have a look at what we will be doing, you think, this month. I'm going to start by saying, actually, Chris, because we've had this cold, wet May, my plants feel very slow to grow. My tomatoes, for instance, are really still only a few inches tall. I don't know if you found the same thing. Uh, Exactly. I've got chilies that don't seem to have moved. I've got quite a few things. I think Plants are very um, sensitive to what's going on around them in terms of temperature, air temperature, dryness. The soil is really, really important. I mean, there's an intellect to a plant. And I think what they tend to do is they go, well, if things aren't right, why do I, why would I expend all this valuable energy? I'll sit tight. I'll wait for better times. Certainly soil temperature is a massive one on an allotment or on an open site. But even my balcony, I've noticed that, um, you know, stuff is not moving. It's just sitting and waiting. And ironically, I was looking at a, a past Facebook post I put out the exact same time last year, because they give you this memory sort of option. And everything was far, far more in front than it is at the moment. You can actually see quite a big difference in growth rates. So plants will sit and they'll wait. And the danger, of course, is that we are creatures of habit as human beings. And we tend to think, oh, it's May. It's going to be hot and sunny. It's spring spring turning into summer. I need to be out watering. And I know for a fact I'm over watering at the moment. I am exactly the same. And you know what's amazing in it? And it doesn't matter how experienced you are. You kind of you, you get habitual. You get to do, you do things out of habit. Even feeding, normally I'm on liquid feeds 
you know, I've been starting much, much earlier than I have done this year, but I've just kind of looked at stuff and gone, no, you're a small plant. You don't need gallons of water. I don't need to feed you a lot yet. I've got to wait for you to be happy, for you to start showing your happiness through growth. And then I can start adding more water and thinking about feeding. It's so intuitive, isn't it? And that's what I love about organic growing is that you really, really are in touch with what the plant is doing and what is happening all around it as well. It's, it's my biggest argument for being an organic grower is I think I've never bonded so well with my plants as I've done since I've become an organic because the observation levels are so, that's how you play the game. You're out, you're looking closely and then the feedback, you know, the growth, the bonding with the plants is much greater. I really believe that. Mm. So true. And talking about plants not growing well, I don't know about you, but I had some seed sowings that just did not work this year. They just didn't germinate. And I guess what I want to say is don't panic. We all think we should be sowing seeds early in the year. And now we're into June and it's too late. Actually, it's not. There's plenty of time to try again. For a start, the soil should have warmed up by now. And with a little bit of rain and the sun's warmth, that's the perfect conditions for germination. So go for it again. If your carrots or French beans didn't work, do it again. You've got plenty of growing time left in the season. Oh, absolutely. It's a myth that you have to shove it all in in the springtime, isn't it? It really is. And also you kind of, by, by continual sowing, especially with the quicker crops like salads and spinaches, you get that perpetual motion so you can harvest and then get the next lot on the go, harvest, get the next one on the go. And you got, I think seed sowing is probably one of the most enjoyable parts of being a gardener. So in, indulge it, I would say. And you, you'll have failures. I've failed quite miserably with cucumbers this year. I sowed them a bit earlier. It's been a bit too cool for them. I probably overwatered them a little bit. I've sown them again. They're up already. I've got my next batch coming in. The curious thing is I've got this bumper crop of cabbages on the go because yeah. every single one yeah. germinated. Yeah. So Christmas <laughs> is just going to come early. There's a cabbage coming out of your cabbage soup all around. Funny with brassicas, isn't it? Because although if I think of the one group of plants that tends to get attacked the most, butterflies, pigeons, all this kind of stuff, but they're actually very viable seed. You can get a lot on the move quite quickly, can't you? It's very easy to over overdo it with the, with the brassicas. Because you tend to get a high germination rate, don't you? I think we have to learn to eat them earlier. Get in there yeah. before the pigeon. Get in there before the caterpillar does. <laughs> well, it's true. And it also, quite a lot of, I mean, I know quite a lot of people, you can eat this, the young kale leaves, that kind of stuff. There's no reason why you can't be adding that to your dinner quite early in the game, is there? Yeah, yeah. And actually talking about brassicas, that brings me on to what's going on this month in terms of pests. And there's plenty because it's party time, frankly, for a lot of pests. <laughs> so, for instance, the cabbage white butterfly will be laying its eggs on my little cabbage plants for sure. So I need to cover them with a I use a very fine mesh and that prevents the butterflies getting in and laying their eggs under the leaves. Similarly, strawberries, my strawberries are coming on beautifully, actually, despite the cold weather the flowering and they're beginning to form fruits so i'll be weeding them watering them if needed and then placing straw under the berries to lift them up off the damp soil and then i put netting over the top and that yep. netting has to be really really firm because mrs blackbird will get in there as fast <laughs> as she can before i can and i don't want to get her trapped in there so make sure if you're putting out netting to stop the birds getting whether it's your peas strawberries or whatever make sure it's really firmly fixed and there's no gaps and then you won't get any disasters with birds getting trapped that's the thing with strawberries uh, all life likes a strawberry don't they i tend to use a good tip is i buy a box of tent pegs and i pin them down with that and you pin them down quite tight intervals and that keeps it really tight and firm and you kind of avoid that problem. Yeah, I've seen people bury their mesh actually into the soil so it goes down below soil level, which is fine. That just makes it a little bit more difficult to access the plant if you need to get inside. Yeah, I was going to say, I get obviously my dreaded horsetail will be coming through my strawberries. So I kind of need to whip it up and get in there and pull it out. The thing about strawberries will be interesting this year because we had a really oh, such delicious strawberries last year, but we had a very hot spring. So I'm curious to see what they taste like this year coming back to the weather. I'll keep you posted. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so what other pests are we seeing? I'm going to talk about aphids because I suspect 
once the warmth of June starts, the aphids will come in their droves because they love the warmth and they love the young growth. Now, we always say, first of all, don't reach for the bright red bug spray. Of course you mustn't. Don't poison them because if you poison the aphids, the chances are you're going to poison the other off-target insect. And we also say don't panic when you see an aphid because aphids are actually a part of the food chain for things like birds feeding their young. And you've got like, I mean, you think things like ladybird larvae and hoverfly larvae, they'll get through 500 aphids a day, those. You know, they really are. They will yeah. control it for you because you just got that food chain going on, basically. Yeah. Chris, I just want to share with you three amazing facts that I've recently found out about aphids. These made me smile. Okay, first of all, did you know that females' aphids don't need to mate in order to reproduce? Mm. They don't have to get off with anyone. They just give birth to live young themselves. So this makes boosting numbers a lot easier. So it also is amazing is you can get three generations of aphid in one female aphid okay. as well. They're nice like Russian one. dolls. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, next one. Aphid poo tastes sweet. Yeah. At least not that I know. I haven't tasted myself but ants enjoy it because yeah. it's made up of excess sugar from the plant sap mm. that they feed on so the ants will actually farm aphids yeah, and by farming yeah. i mean they get them together so yeah. that they can milk their sugary poo i yeah. like that one yeah that's good then, also that's also a problem because you can get sooty molds coming in because so you kind of get a knock on yeah yeah and then finally aphids release alarm pheromones when they're under attack and this is to alert other aphids nearby but ladybirds have learnt to recognise this alarm call and use it to seek the aphids out for an easy meal. So, I think what I love about it is this, there's this interchange going on right under your nose, which you probably aren't even aware of. Yeah, don't destroy the thread is basically it. And, you know, some things are amazing. You don't need pesticides. Get, get, get a fennel, let it flower, let the hoverflies come in. Hoverfly larvae will eat 500 aphids a day. They're ravenous. You can let them do the work. OK, I think we've learnt enough about aphids now. So <laughs> I'm going to move on to tomato plants. And the reason I want to talk about those is that they appear to be really quite healthy, except some of the lower leaves have either gone yellow or some of them have gone purple underneath. Have you experienced this, Chris? I have, yeah. The purple I've certainly had, I've experienced quite a lot of. And I think that's due to fluctuations in day and night temperatures. So if you get a particularly cold temperature at night, there's a plant defence system there that's happening. Yes, um, we've always talked about hardening off, making sure you're adapting, protecting your plants at night, airing them through the day, you'll greatly reduce that. Sometimes a purpling of leaf can also indicate a potassium shortage. That's another thing that can maybe cause it. So maybe a little bit of liquid feed, a bit of bocking 14 comfrey might solve it as well. I think the important thing is to remember that the plant itself isn't unhealthy. This is not a disease. This is the plant navigating its way through this interesting, tricky growing conditions. Yes, exactly. Another thing, Chris, that I've been looking at are my herbs, because a lot of them are coming into flower this month. And the flower Flowers are beautiful and they're absolutely loved by bees and butterflies. What I tend to do is I cut some of them because by cutting the flowers off, I'm going to encourage fresh growth, which I can use in my cooking. But I leave most of the flowers on them because, as I say, for the beneficial insects, the pollinators, they will just love them. Yeah, lavender bush or something like that is absolutely covered, isn't it, it's when they're in flower? Absolutely. You can hear them buzzing almost, yeah, with with their bees. So, Chris, what's going on down in your allotment? Well, it's loads going on down there. It's been a slow start, hasn't it? Um, on some of the gardens. I've looked after I'm quite busy in those as well this is the time of year I'm still propagating I'm big into my propagation you can still do softwoods now although it's coming to the end of the season but what I like to do this time of year is do what I think called layering with shrubs what that means is I'll take a lower branch of a common shrub like viburnum or fatsia or dutia, wygelia, and I'll bend it down to the ground. I'll maybe put a little bit of soil and sand mixed together, but I'll scrape off the underneath of that branch. I expose the cambium, the vascular bundle, and I'll pin it to that bit of sandy soil with a tent peg, and then I'll let it root. And that means I can come along maybe late winter or early spring, sever that branch away, and I'll have a new plant. It's another one of those if you want to keep a plant, give it away type things where I can then give it to friends and they can have it in their garden. And I've just managed to sustain that species. That's such a good tip. And also, presumably, you are propagating a plant in soil and an area where it's happy, where it's growing well. So you're going to get a good, strong plant as a result. Two things I believe in is uh, local buying and I believe in grown locally because exactly as you described, they're 
they've adapted. They're already in those conditions. That's a really good organic message. Thank you. Well, I hope it's a great month for you. Well, I'll still be out and about. I'll always enjoy it, that's for sure, getting that fresh air. And uh, yeah, I'm always grateful for my for my passion for gardening, Sarah. And also, Chris, we've got these lovely long days in June. You know, it is um, the longest day, yeah. isn't it? So yeah, you've it got isn't. <laughs> every excuse to be out until 10 o'clock at night. Brilliant. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers, Sarah. Bye-bye. Garden Organic Zone Gardens have been at Wrighton in Warwickshire for nearly 40 years. Last year we downsized, giving us the opportunity to create a whole new set of growing spaces for visitors to see the organic growing principles in action. Chris went along to meet Emma O'Neill, the head gardener, for a sneak preview of the gardens. Perhaps I should warn you, listening to an outside broadcast can be challenging on the ears. Bear with us as wind, aeroplanes, even birdsong all have a way of getting in on the conversation. And who knew gravel could be so crunchy? So here I am at the Garden Organic Demonstration Garden. It's a lovely day. Everything's growing. It looks very beautiful. I'm here with Emma O'Neill, the head gardener here. Hi, Emma. Hi, Chris. How are you today? You good? I'm good, thank you. Well, you've done an incredible amount of work here, haven't you, over the winter, really? And it's it was you know it was, you started from scratch, and I know because I came down and gave you a hand a few times, and it you was did. full on. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to your garden team, yourself, and obviously the volunteers as well. It worked really hard. It's going to show people organic practices, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it's been built specifically as a demonstration garden rather than a show garden. And so it's to demonstrate all the organic principles, really. Right. So we're going to go. We're going to have a walk around and have a look at all those, aren't we? You're going to guide yeah. me through. Just tell me a little bit about the structure of the garden, though. How you, how it's laid out. How you've gone about that. So we've set it out into areas. So we've got the potager, which is the fruit and veg area. We have our ornamental area, which is all floral. We've got a container garden a space that we're hoping to use as an outdoor learning wildlife area which incorporates a pond and then we have um, a glass house in the centre so we're lucky enough to have that for propagation and where we are now is what we consider our working area so our nursery bed, shed, compost Right. So it's a great place to start, isn't it? Because there's lots going on here, isn't there? That's yeah. amazing. There's loads of loads of stuff going on. But obviously, all organic gardeners, rule one, take care of your soil. And so we're here at the compost base. Describe the, what you do with these a little bit. So we're lucky enough to have six compost bays. And basically, we just compost as much as possible so any vegetation anytime we mow the lawn we have now got a small shredder so anything that's a bit thick we're trying to shred down because that will obviously get the decomposition going quicker and we regularly turn the compost heaps and the turning obviously just helps speed up that process and mix it up sure so. and so you turn it to get that more distribution through it basically yeah and the and air into it as well do you like the air to get through it i suppose yeah you need the air to get through it and we tend not to cover it right that will just be let it degrade in its own time yeah so. i mean it's a bit of a misnomer to say that it's fast <laughs> compost <laughs> Because it will take a while. I mean, but we have had compost that's ready sort of between six and nine months. Mm. But then we've really turned that sort of every month. So uh, little miracles take patience because it is a bit of a miracle, isn't it? Compost? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's yeah. fascinating. And I mean, it's especially good when you see the brandling worms in it. Yes. When you're turning it, it's teeming with life when you have a real close look. Well, it's so, incredible, isn't it? It is a whole yeah. ecosystem in its own right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. And so obviously the reason you're composting is to keep that soil health. So I always kind of think, of compost it's like black gold isn't it it's so yeah. important you have to use it quite sparingly and be targeted to it so what will you use these the, when the finished the, the compost is finished where will you target it we tend to use it mainly as a mulch but also sometimes so i mentioned earlier we've got a container garden so we will probably mix it with some regular bagged compost just to give it a bit more oomph mm. really a bit more depth to it but mainly we tend to use it as a soil improver. Right, OK. And that's quite important, is it? Because it releases its goodness slowly as opposed to... Yeah. If we were using artificial fertilisers, you just get that blast, don't you? And But compost gradually feeds the soil. Is That's very important. Yeah, it's a slow release. And obviously the worms and the other little creatures in the soil will be taking it down, mixing it in. For those people that practice no dig, it's even better because you're not having to do anything with the soil structure. Well, that's an important point. Tell us a little bit about no dig. <laughs> so this year, in the potager we're running an experiment where two of the beds on our four crop rotation are going to be no dig we're experimenting one to see if the yield's better Uh also to see if actually the microorganisms are better underneath that soil and also just generally to see if it's any easier 
because mm. one of the things that it's sold on is that it's far less weeds. Yes. Easier to maintain. So they're saying, what they're saying is if you keep disturbing the ground, you're inviting the weed species in, and that, that, yeah. that doesn't happen if you're yeah. no digging. Is that the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know yourself, if you expose any weed seeds to the light when you're digging, yeah. then they'll start to germinate. It should, in theory, keep the weeds down. I'm a bit old fashioned because I actually like digging. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm just saying, no gardener would, uh, would deny that, I don't think. No. But, but it's interesting you mention it because we've got new knowledge now, new science. We're discovering yeah. more about soil and so old ways are not necessarily the best. So we're discovering new things, yeah, aren't we? exactly. What we're thinking is really that the, the, the organisms in the soil are, are doing the job for us, I suppose. That's, that's the thinking, isn't it? Yeah, they are. And of course, when you're digging the soil, you're damaging the structure. Mm and you're damaging their own little microclimate, their habitat. Yeah, so you're wrecking their home in a way, aren't you? Exactly, yes. Well, speaking of all creatures great and small, I'm, di- I'm dying to look a look at the pond and let's talk a little bit about wildlife gardening. So, Emma, we're sitting by this beautiful pond, surrounded by no-dig beds, a beautiful glass house in the background. It really does look amazing. Obviously, an organic garden is a shared space. It's a shared with all the nature and all, the, and you want to get that balance going. Give me your tips for a wildlife gardening and, and bio-control maybe as well. Well, we're lucky because we've got enough space to have quite a decent-sized pond. If you can incorporate some water somewhere that is a great thing because you attract quite a lot of beneficials so you know the toads the frogs the newts all of those things that will eat a lot of pests that you get also you create like this habitat we've got plants that have a lot of foliage they flower at all different times of the year so there's something throughout the whole season what we've created here is got an actual wildlife border and there that incorporates bug hotels plants that have evergreen foliage we've got the grasses so things Mm. can hide in it and over winter and then it's backed on by this yew hedge right which as you know recently lots of people have been talking about hedging and how important it is it's pretty key for wildlife really including the birds uh, providing shelter winter food so i think you just need to try and be as diverse as you can Mm. Even in the veg garden, if you can get some flowers in, it will help with beneficial insects, it will deter pests, and it just creates sort of a, a better balance, yeah. I think. So you'll bring the pollinators in, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and you'd want you'd want stuff like the hoverfly larvae, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So the hoverfly larvae, the ladybirds, the bees. And obviously, the better the pollination, the better the yield's going to be. Having the flowers around to bring them in initially is great, really. And we find that works really well. And this year, we are intending to put a lot more companion planting in. Previously, we've kind of planted, say, a block of flowers and then the rest has been veg. This year, we're going to turn that around a bit and try and have more flowers growing amongst our veg. So you're going to interplant. I do it on my allotment where I like to be quite free with it. Is that what you're going to do? Yeah. Yeah. And also, I think because we've decided this is more of a potager, we want it to look pretty at the same time as as well as functional. Brilliant. So when when we get visitors here, they'll be able to see the examples like the new hedge here. So they can come along and get those ideas from the garden. Yeah. We've also got the your hedge that is also evergreen and both of those are great examples because they can be cut back hard right. whereas some of the conifers as you know if you cut into them yeah they'll they brown won't, up yeah, yeah and yeah. then they won't rejuvenate and then behind us we've got the british native hedging that just provides another dimension extra food and because it's british and it's native yes you're gonna have bird life and all the goodies coming yeah and just a little bit before we finish and move on what is it difficult to look after a pond is that much does much maintenance go into that we haven't had too many problems with it we're surrounded by hornbeams so we do have to remove the leaves and at the height of the leaf drop we did put net over it because we were just getting so much a lot of people worry about things like blanket weed and duckweed to be perfectly honest i probably don't know anybody who's not going to get something like that because if you're getting wildlife in they bring it in but i think if you've got oxygenators in marginal plants then you're going to really limit that I mean, one of the top tips if you do have blanket weed is the barley straw is quite good right, if you okay. have a little bit of that put in your pond. But generally, we've been very lucky. The one thing I would say, though, is not to panic if the water level drops and then fill it up with tap water okay. because you really then change the balance of the pond. So you're talking about pH and that kind of stuff, yeah. aren't you? Soft water, yeah. hard water. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, so you <laughs> really need to wait for the rainwater to do it. If you've got water that are collecting rainwater, obviously you can use that. But also the uh, wildlife 
stuff that's in the pond adapts. So it adapts to those changes right. in level. If you're then adding something else into the mix, you can upset the balance. Sure. So it's a natural for the pond to drop, isn't it? It's yes, natural to course. do that. Yeah. And, and when it comes to wildlife, I see at the back end of the pond, you've got a lot of pebbles, and that's access, isn't it, to allow frogs and stuff. And you need to have some sort of slope to allow access in. Yeah, you've got to have a slope, really. So we've, we've called it our beach. So you can see the pebbles on the top, but actually there's quite a lot under the water as well. And then at the opposite end, we've got these irises, which they can clamber onto. Right. So it's really important because you will get things drowning otherwise, okay. which is really upsetting. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, it looks amazing. I mean, it's, uh, if I just describe for a minute, it kind of got this beautiful herbaceous plant and that swoops around it. And then the, that goes along in a border, which is in front of the yew hedge. It looks really nice. and It's all really looking healthy and alive. You're doing something right, mate. Well, Emma, we've moved on and we're now sitting in, this is the container garden area, and I think the classroom area, some herd raised beds as yeah, well, very beautiful. Right. I'm sitting on a recycled bench and that kind of gives me the opportunity to talk about, obviously a big part of organic garden, one of its principles is how you utilise materials and make sure you're recycling. And yeah. tell me a little bit about how you do that in the garden. What we tend to do here is we recycle all our plastic pots. And if you look after them, which really is trying to just keep them clean, store them somewhere that's safe if they're out in the sun too long they will get brittle because that would be the worst thing if every time you had a plant in you then threw the pot away you're adding to the problem so if you can clean it and then reuse yeah. it that's ideal and in a way as well but i suppose in a, a big part of recycling is our, the way we reuse our seed here isn't it the heritage seed library in a way yeah. making sure we keep heirloom plants going you, you're very involved in that as well aren't you yeah well we try to showcase as many of the heritage seed varieties as we can in the garden to obviously to promote them and to as you say keep them going any sort of seed saving is another way of recycling really yeah. and then you're not having to buy we're not getting carbon footprints no. shipping them in from other places we're keeping it inside the garden of course the other thing that you reuse is the rainwater so we touched on it earlier yep. so we have water butts here yep. we make our own feeds here so obviously most people will know that garden organic is synonymous with comfrey yep. the bocking 14 so you literally stuff your drain pipe with the leaves weight it down and then as the rain goes through you put a little jar on the bottom of the strain pipe and it, it produces this feed very good balanced fertilizer thanks to yeah. mr hills our uh, our exactly, founder and yeah. then that gives me brings me on quite nicely i think to the fact that you obviously you can't use any pesticides here any of these horrible poisons yeah. that, uh, that a lot of get used in our, in our amenity areas what challenges does that throw up because it's very easy isn't it for someone in the back garden to go well i've got a weed i'll just murder it obviously we're not in the business of that i think patience is key if you've got the pest you will get the predator now if you try and get rid of that pest straight away you're not going to then get the ladybirds in or the mm. parasitic wasps so you do need to be patient that isn't to say don't be vigilant so and i yeah. suppose in a way that that waiting for nature to do its thing is key isn't it, it um, definitely <laughs> yeah. under glass it's harder because obviously you've got an artificial environment yes. yeah and it kind yeah. of it changes the equation doesn't it yeah. Pure, yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just going to have a little walk around the last part of the garden which is the big planting beds behind here and we can talk a little bit about the design everything's growing away i mean but it is a demonstration garden so tell me about what's going to go on here and how it's been designed to accommodate that yeah so basically this is the ornamental area one of of the things this was designed for really was so that when you'd been in the fruit and veg area that this would be a place you could come and reflect on but also it's key to demonstrate to people that you can grow ornamentals organically right okay because they kind of get left out don't they it's all veg and i get a bit frustrated by that because yeah. gardening is a much bigger subject trees lawns whatever yeah, of yeah and i i personally am more passionate about the floral side and we've tried to design this really in line with how the soil and the seasons affect it. So the middle bed is very, very hot and dry all the time. So it has a sort of tropical feel mm -hmm. to it. And then the furthest bed is far more in the shade. So we've chosen plants that suit those environments. And yeah. it's and it, the beds are planted to suit the climates. There's the microclimates yeah. of each situation, which is, as a gardener, that's really important, isn't it? Yeah, you'd be amazed at how one bit of your garden has got a completely different microclimate mm. to another we found the bed that was in the shade actually had so much more water so it's holding it more yeah, yeah, yeah. holding on to it because one of the things we put in there i think it just does not want to tolerate the wet yeah. so it's all it's all a learning curve and th that's sort of what we want to get over to people as well mm. and don't be afraid to make mistakes yeah you know everybody does it and yeah. 
you might love a particular plant and think, well, I really want it, and you put it in, and it just might not do. Yeah, sure. I think uh, wisdom is born from error is a good gardening yeah. motto in many ways. And, and I think coming here and looking at this, you can see all this in operation, and you pick those ideas up, don't yeah. you, and things to try. And if you, I mean, you've got the pathways around here. It's, it's very well designed to get groups of people in isn't it and then the classroom will be mainly over by the other the other side of the garden by the glass house won't it so people will come in and be able to walk around and then go and attend classes i know you've got me up here to do one on container yeah. gardening yeah so it's been designed so that actually you will be taken on a tour as opposed to individuals just popping by really we want to be able to impart our knowledge yeah so we will be taking you round. And Brilliant. What a really good example of organic garden. demonstration garden, isn't it? That's what it is. Yeah. You've done, you and your staff have done really, really well. I know how hard you've worked on it. You know, I really do. And I'm, I'm excited for people to come along and see it and experience it. And like I say, various people are doing talks. You'll be doing some. I'll be yeah. doing the odd one. And so if you want to find out more about that, keep an eye on the website, www.gardenorganic.org.uk, because we'd like to see you here. And you've got to come and see this wonderful garden. And thanks for your time, Emma. I really appreciate no, thank it. thank you. All right? Excellent. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with Chris, but before we leave the gardens, I wanted to have a quick word with our project supporters, Viridian Nutrition. I caught up with Cheryl Thallon, Viridian's founder, to thank her for their generosity in funding some of Emma's planting. It's a quick thank you, and if you want to hear more about some of the herbs they chose, I'll be joined later this month by Viridian's head nutritionist, when we discuss the importance of vitamins and supplements in our diet. Think of it as a little virtual goodie bag if you can't get to the gardens themselves when they open later this summer. Good morning, Cheryl. It's very interesting that Viridian became involved with Garden Organic. What what was your thinking there? Oh, I've been a huge, huge fan of Brighton Gardens for many years. Viridian is only five miles away from the beautiful organic gardens there. So we visited many, many times. So when the opportunity came up to sponsor this new demo garden, we were absolutely thrilled to, to get involved. Clearly, the green uh, synergy between Viridian and Garden Organic is very clear. You're very based on education and you have a huge passion for the environment, just as we do. Can you tell me a bit about Viridian? Well, that's very easy. You know, Viridian's my baby and uh, I, I fell in love with the natural products industry when I was 18 as a vegetarian. I started working at health food stores when I was 21. And just the whole natural products area and the whole ethos, the movement really captured my imagination. Actually, quick question. Why the name Viridian? Viridian's a beautiful colour. It's when the astronauts went out into space and they looked back at the Earth the earth was described as the colour Viridian and that just captured my imagination. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Gaia and the whole belief in the whole spirit of the universe and the spirit of the planet. And I thought Viridian, the name, really represented what I was trying to do with, with our supplement company. That's a beautiful image. Tell mm. me then, what is an ethical vitamin? Yeah, it's a strange one, really. I didn't coin the, the, the word ethical. When we first launched, there was a magazine called Here's Health and another magazine called Ethical Consumer. And both of them use the term ethical when they described Viridian. So immediately, being a bit of a wordsmith and marketeer, I le leapt all over that. And we used the word the leading brand of ethical vitamins because we were the only ones that were exploring purity, the environment, and also had a charitable donation program. And that, I think, is really the, the three pillars for Viridian's ethical positioning. So it ticks all the boxes of people, planet and profit, I'm guessing. Absolutely. And you also source um, organic products where possible. We do indeed. We now have more than 220 supplements in the range, about 75 of which are certified organic by the Soil Associations. And we're very proud of that. There's no other company in the UK that has as many organic supplements within its range as we do. Cheryl, just out of interest, are you a gardener yourself? You know, I'm a Londoner and so I, uh, concrete is really my comfort space. I can't deny it. But we moved out into uh, beautiful Northamptonshire about 20 years ago when, when we set Viridian up and uh, I've become much more a fan of, of the wild open spaces. We now have an acre at our home that we're gradually converting into a full organic garden, which I'm very excited about. As a Londoner, you're getting your hands dirty in the good Northampton For the first soil. time in my life, it's true, it's true. It's a, bit, it's a bit scary, you know, the reality of getting out there in the garden. I find it quite intimidating. I've got great admiration for gardeners. I think it is, when you, when you as, as I say, as I come from London and the concrete world, it's, it can be quite, quite scary to be out there, but the pleasure that you derive when you really overcome that is extraordinary and the peace of mind and everything that goes with it is really rewarding. Thank you very much for joining us and thanks to Viridian for sponsoring Garden Organic's lovely demonstration garden. Thank you very much Sarah, it's been a pleasure.
And now it's time to open the post bag. I'm joined as usual by Chris and our colleagues at Garden Organic, Hannah and Anton. Morning. Hello. Hello. Hannah, what have you got for us today? Well, the first question is about cucumbers. So um, someone's contacted us to say their cucumbers have started flowering and they were told they should remove all the male flowers. Is this necessary? And how do they know what a male flower is? Anton, can you kick us off with this one? The main reason that you are told to remove the male flowers is that when they pollinate the female flowers, it can end up making the cucumbers taste bitter. However, there are a few complications behind that, according to what sort of variety and the conditions that you're growing under. So with indoor varieties, a telegraph is one that's quite often in a glass house, you are advised to remove the male flowers. However, if you're growing an outdoor ridge type of cucumber, um, such as market moor or crystal lemon, those really nice sort of yellow spiky cucumbers, then you're advised not to remove the male flowers, just to leave them on and the bees will help to pollinate them. Do they not taste bitter, Anton, if you leave them, even no, though they're, they're growing outside? They're fine. They're OK. So you might want to, to recognise what a male and a female flower looks like. And actually, this is really very easy. A female flower has got a little fruit underneath it. You can see a little sort of ball of the fruit forming just underneath the flower. So that's obviously a female flower. So you want to leave those ones on the plant. The male flower just has a long stalk, no fruit at all on it. And often those are the ones that appear first. So those are the ones that you need to remove. So really, it's quite easy. I, I think it's quite a satisfying job, actually, just going going around and looking at the flowers and take removing the ones that shouldn't be on there. I guess it's the overall to understand what you're growing. That's right. There's also another complication. Sometimes there are varieties which are listed as they're listed as F1 all female varieties. And these tend to be more sort of recently introduced like um, Bella or Diva are two types. And those ones do not have any male flowers on them. They produce all female flowers. So you don't have to worry about them. However, you have to be careful not to grow a ridge cucumber next to one of these, because obviously if it's producing male flowers, it will then fertilise those all-female flower varieties, so they will end up tasting bitter. So the secret is to read the seed packet clearly. Chris, are you a cucumber grower? I've got quite a lot. Yeah, I grew some amazing cucumbers last year because it was a warm summer. This year has been a little bit different. We've had much cooler weather and I've got a completely different problem. And that is I get withering on the stem a very young plant so when they get up to like four leaf stage quite small leaves they just stem starts to wither and they collapse and i'm i'm gonna think anton might be help me out here i've got a feeling that is probably due to the moisture content in the soil i think i've overwatered them and i think what happens is you kind of go down the allotment and you water things you might have overwatered them and because the temperature is so cool the moisture is sitting in the pot sitting in the compost and then causing that plant some problems yeah cucumbers are quite susceptible to fungal diseases at, at the base like a sort of damping off there's two things really like you said it's the it's the overwatering that you have to be really careful of cucumbers need watering little and often and i think with the sort of damp cool weather we tend to get into habits of always putting the same amount of water on but this year we really need, need to put much less water on because it's been such a cool spring the other thing is when you plant out your cucumbers don't plant them too deep because that leaves a layer of sort of wet soil around the base of the cucumber and that makes them more susceptible to rotting so does that include when you're pricking out because as a rule when we prick out we tend to plant quite deep don't we down to the, to the cotyledon so you get rooting on the stem does that do you avoid that rule with cucumber definitely yeah don't put them too deep just for the same reason that sort of damp soil around the stem can make them um, susceptible to rotting off another tip that i heard was that cucumbers like a good nitrogen feed and I, well this is brilliant because I'm overrun with stinging nettles at the moment so if you just cut down as many nettles as you can bear to put them in a bucket fill it with water soak it for a month you've got a very high nitrogen feed for free and your cucumbers will love it yeah I agree it saves you having to spend money on those expensive plant feeds uh, and it's more environmentally friendly as well brilliant thank you so much so question number two I'm using organic slug pellets 
and I'm worried they might harm other wildlife. Is this the case, Sarah? Okay, so I guess many of us resort to slug pellets at one time or another, but certainly some are more poisonous and more dangerous than others. It's the ones that have metaldehyde in them that are the most poisonous ones, and they really should have been banned, and there was a legal loophole which prevented it happening. But the good news is, as of next March next year, there will be no more slug pellets with metaldehyde in it. But you can get organic slug pellets and they contain ferric phosphate. This works on the slug's gut. It alters the metabolism within the gut and that causes them to stop feeding and then they die within three to six days. It sounds as cruel as it is, but it is considerably less toxic than metaldehyde. There's still a problem, though, with the other ingredients in these tablets. These are chemicals which help bond the iron molecules and make them more toxic. These ingredients are known as chelators. Sorry, I'm getting a bit scientific here. But these chelators also will have a poisonous effect on the soil life, such as earthworms, if they're consumed in large quantities. So you can't get a totally poison-free slug pellet. So my advice would be use them if you have to. But if you do use them, use them very sparingly. Really, just a very light sprinkling usually works. Chris, how do you deal with slugs? Well, I agree with Sarah there in the fact that I don't use them as a last resort, to be honest with you. I only use it as a very last resort. We had a very dry early spring and then um, the rains came and the slugs awoke and the snails awoke. And I kind of noticed one thing about how they operate. And that is uh, in my cloches in down the allotment, I see the younger plants and the plants that get attacked. So if I've got slightly bigger plants, slightly bigger tomatoes or slightly bigger peppers, chilies, they tend to get left. It's the little ones. All leaf stays are lovely and fleshy. They tend to go for those. They tend to rub those out. They obviously like the plants with less lignin in the leaves, less lignin in the cells. They don't like the older material. So just be aware of when you're putting stuff out, I think, and, and what you're exposing it to. The slugs and the snails will go for the younger material. And I tend to find that the most crucial part of protecting my plants from these, these pests. That's such a good point, Chris. And I think especially this time of year and when we've had this particularly damp month of May, there's so much lush dampness and young green growth. It's just like one big party for the slugs at the well you, you can't really blame them can you you know it's just yeah, how do we get a compromise it's what it's about i kind of had eight peppers in a tray and i and i put them down they were quite small and they ate six of them and i was gutted about that just take two just take two leave the other six come on <laughs> play the game <laughs> chris i think another thing that's quite key in this is letting your plants harden off we yeah. talk about the lush young green growth it's getting the plant a little bit tougher isn't it before we put it out well i kind of think i suppose a hard enough you could say it's a very tradesman expression but maybe a better one is you've got to acclimatize them so that means basically you've got to get them used to that outdoor life um so you've got them in a molly cold propagator or a cloche or a cold frame they're happy they're growing away but if you suddenly put them out and it's windy and a little bit cooler than you like you and they're all fleshy and all soft and fleshy suddenly the slugs will be on them the wind will damage them so just what to do is just put them out let them sunbathe for like three or four five hours every day then put, bring them back in the evening so they don't get that exposure and gradually what you happen is that will make your plants tougher get the lignin into the leaves and make them much more resistant to slugs and snails brilliant thanks both so our third question today is about composting cardboard so um, a listener has been told that the inks on cardboard have heavy metals in them so they shouldn't put them on the compost heap is this true Anton? This is quite a tricky one I, we sort of researched this and there's quite a lot of conflicting information out there first of all I want to say that the cardboard is absolutely fine it's just obviously made from recycled cardboard or wood pulp and also the glues in cardboard are fine in packaging they're all made from Dutch the printing ink, which is what we're asking about, most of it is actually made from soya bean oil nowadays. Most inks are vegetable based. Now, the pigments, they are mostly made from organic compounds, which will break down quite quickly. But there is still a chance that there may be some metals which are put into inks to give them their bright colours. Those are quite sort of heavily regulated, the amounts of put in, especially if the cardboard has had anything to do with food packaging, then the regulations are even more strict then. So we're talking about really tiny amounts, because when you think about the amount of ink which is actually on cardboard, it is pretty small. And a study done by the Centre for Alternative Technology did actually say that the amounts of contaminants were very, very small. So in moderation, I would say it would be okay to put them in your compost. I wouldn't be 
piling in loads and loads of stuff with re really sort of bright coloured inks on it. People are often worried about glossy materials as well. And I would be pretty reluctant to put glossy materials in because they take a long time to break down just because they sort of resilient to water and they may have also been plasticized, which you definitely don't want to be putting into your compost. The thing about cardboard, I always think, Hannah, is that it's in some ways it's a win win, isn't it? If you follow the mantra of reduce, reuse, recycle, you're reusing something that has actually already been made from recycled materials. So it just sort of ticks all those boxes. Would you agree, Anton? Yeah, it's a bit of a strange one because when I've sort of spoken to local authorities, they say that it's actually better to be putting a cardboard back into the recycling stream to keep it in that stream to prevent you having to make more cardboard. However, cardboard or paper is a very useful source of brown materials in your compost if, if you're producing too many green materials. So I, I would say firstly put it in your recycling, but let's say you've got a bin full of grass clippings then balancing it out with little bits of cardboard or paper then re really helps. That's really interesting because I'd always thought that the, as much as you can deal with kind of yourself on site, the better it helps reduce your carbon footprint, you know, stops the transportation to take it to a recycling centre. But what you're saying is that's not necessarily the case here, actually. Because they will be using virgin wood product to make fresh new cardboard. So cardboard is actually one of the examples of where the closed loop system is actually working with recycling. We know it's not with plastic. Plastic hasn't yet closed that loop completely. But with cardboard, it actually has. Exactly. Exactly. You're sort of preventing more sort of raw materials having to be put into the stream and, and closing the loop, just like you say. So as a summary, cardboard, stick it in the recycling if you can, but it is a useful addition to the compost heap along with paper. Don't worry too much about the inks, but perhaps try and go for the cardboard which has less ink on it. Exactly. And thank you, Hannah. Those are three really good questions. I enjoyed those hugely. It's always good to get questions from listeners, so please do feel free to email us at podcast at gardenorganic.org. Dot uk and we'll see if we can fit it into hannah's post bag we really do love your questions believe it or not don't don't be shy come in send us your questions we love answering them it makes us makes us feel wanted doesn't it sarah and it keeps anton on his toes and that's always a good <laughs> thing okay guys thanks a lot bye bye bye, -bye. bye. cheers bye, -bye. bye. Well, sadly, we've now come to the end. And if you want to follow up on anything you've heard us discuss today, then go to the Garden Organic website. That's gardenorganic.org.uk. Why not check out becoming a member? You'll enjoy our dedicated gardening advice team, get our magazine, and you'll help us spread the organic word. It's also a great present for anyone you know who loves growing the organic way. Coming up in our next episode, I thought it would be fun to investigate some of the herbs in our new gardens. So I'm joined by Viridian's head nutritionist, Jenny Carson. That'll be a little bumper listening package for you mid-month. And in July, Chris and I are back, this time investigating just how sustainable is your local garden centre. Have a wonderful month of June. Enjoy every moment in your growing space, no matter what the weather brings. And thanks for listening. Bye for now. Our thanks to the Organic Catalogue for sponsoring us and to Kevin McLeod for the music. <laughs>